hear our rock and music, it's time for I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist Podcast, episode something, season two. Yeah, oh, good. And every time you say I was a teenage fundamentalist, I always think I was a teenage dirtbag by Weedus. Every uh, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that would um be a good theme song if we could afford that one, wouldn't it? would be great what you know one of the things that surprised me about that song is a cover of it which is awesome and don't judge me um, or judge me whatever i know what you're gonna say and i'm already judging you one direction yeah yeah or one of the guys from one direction wasn't it was it no no was it no it was fully one direction yeah yeah it was fully one direction and um i uh, because you know one of my daughters obsessed by one direction and she yeah, I remember that. Remember, my my son came and drew on one of the, her posters one day, and I had to go and buy her a brand new one because he just decided <laughs> to draw <laughs> mustaches and glasses on all the members of One Direction. Half of them have now grown mustaches and beards, and a couple of them wear glasses. So I think he's he was a futurist. <laughs> That's what he was. He wasn't a he wasn't wrecking things. But I forgot about that. You know, I forgot about it. That was a little bit funny. But um, yeah, they do an amazing cover of it. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, I've never heard it. My son told me about it. He said, oh, One Direction do a cover of this. And he was upset that people didn't realise it was a cover because, you know, I, I have indoctrinated him well and truly into 90s music. So, yeah, he was he was quite upset that his mates thought it was a One Direction song. Remember, jump into our Facebook page. I was a teenage fundamentalist. There's a bunch of good people in there having lots of good chats, big group therapy session essentially um but i think it's um it it is really helpful there's a bit of reminiscing in in there but there's also some good work happening with people helping each other out also our twitter account what was that one at was teenage wasn't it that uh that has been awesome as well a bit of traffic coming through that so jump in get involved yeah and if you want to support the podcast help us with the advertising and getting the word out that kind of thing you can find us on patreon just search i was a teenage fundamentalist or iwatf and you can find us there and you can support us if a couple of people give a few bucks then we can run some ongoing commercials ongoing ads across facebook and hopefully build the community that way yeah i mean you can give a one-off or um a or you can subscribe but anything is helpful and thank you to those who have um, contributed to that and again we will remain 100 percent free regardless but it, as you know we may not uh, be 100 percent free of advertising we do love a name drop and a bit of product placement as you as you know also redbubble is another opportunity to just have a bit of fun get in get some i was a teenage fundamentalist merch uh, whether it's a hoodie that t is wearing right now or it's a long sleeve t-shirt that my partner stole from me when i got it she loves it wears it around uh, or you can get a mug you can get stickers whatever it's a bit of fun um get on board with that one we do get 20 percent of every sale which again goes towards the advertising and the running costs very good so Dating and marriage. Now, this is something that was really high profile, I guess, in terms of our experience. And I think a a big part of it was because we were young, because we were in our teens and because we were in our 20s and still thinking with our genitals. But it was Mm -hmm. it was a huge part of our experience, wasn't it? Huge part. And um, I think it was a huge part of the control which we experienced in our lives as well, because I think um, there was certainly a lot of control by leaders exerted through the dating and marriage space, that's for sure. So I'm going to start with the Revival Centre, if that's all right. And I know that not everyone listening to this can relate to the absolute extreme cultishness of the Revival Centre. But I do think that what we see as seeds in broader Pentecostalism sort of blew out to full grown fruit to use the uh, the Pente lingo in the in the Revival Centre. And I think some of the things that I'm going to talk about today, you may have seen in your broader Pentecostal church, your, your AOG, your Triple C, your COC. Nobody loves an acronym more than the Pentecostals. But I do want to start in the Revival Centre because that's really where it all started for me. We were obsessed with relationships and we we're obsessed with marriage. And I think that's partly because the church was obsessed with our relationships and the the church was obsessed with our with our marriages and the church was obsessed with the F word, right? Which is everybody knows, no, it's not fuck, it's fornication. Yes. So we had special guidelines, special rules, printed rules in the revival center around what you could and couldn't do. 
around your relationship. And one of the first ones, and I haven't got them anymore, I've, you know, I, I certainly haven't got a list, but I can remember them. They were seared in our brains. And one of the first things that we had in there was, they called it keeping company, and you had to notify the pastor if you decided to keep company. And you had to be, boys had to be 17 and girls could be 16 before they could officially keep company in the church. And do you know why, B? No. Because the state legislation for being allowed to marry in case you did fornicate up was those ages. And so you needed to make, they needed to make sure that if you did fuck around, that they could force you to marry. And so 16 for girls, 17 for boys before you're allowed to officially keep company. Now, of course, we all sort of kept company, you know, when we were a bit younger, but that was that was the extent of the control because if you fur, 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 fornicated, they wanted to be able to force you to marry. Wow. That is quite frightening, but it, it makes sense, though. From a logistic sense, good on them. Well, that's right. And a lot of the Revival Centre leaders were ex-military. And mm. so, yeah, they were they were all about rules and guidelines. And so they, they said they had to notify the pastors. They said, oh, you know, it's not asking for permission. It's just notifying us. But they could fucking say no. And they could tell you, no, nah, you can't date that person or, you know, it's not in your best interest or, you know, we're not even going to give you a reason. So it was certainly really? about asking for permission. And also, if you broke up, you also yep. had to notify the pastors you had to let them know. I don't think that they would necessarily force you back into a relationship unless you fornicated. We'll come to that yep. in a minute. But, yeah, they wanted to know everything, everything that was going on. That's control at its best. That's control at its absolute best. Like I've told you before, the revival centres, they did a good cult. There was a three-month waiting period, right? There was a cooling-off <laughs> period. So, yeah, true. This is true. This is the sort of control they had. And you had to keep these rules, right? So, if you broke up with someone, you weren't allowed to go out with another person for three months. And of course, what that did is it sort of drove everybody underground. You know, they were all keeping it secret for the for the extra month or whatever they had to do. But that was that was another rule. You could only date people in the church, in the revival centers, right? So yeah. you couldn't date someone from the AOG or the, you know, some other Pentecostal church, only people in the revival centers. So there was a very small pool of people to draw from, especially yeah. in your local assembly. That's what we called it. We didn't call them campuses back then. We called them assemblies. So very small pool of people to draw from. And there was a lot of long distance relationships across assemblies. So people would be dating someone from, you know, a, a smaller town or a bigger city or whatever that they were doing. But what a lot of people did be was that they would try to bring people in from outside the church. So they would meet a girl at work or meet a girl at school, whatever. Then they would bring her into the church, try and get her saved and baptized and speaking in tongues, wait their three month period. And then they could, you know, go out with her or him. So there's a lot of people doing that. But another thing to stress is that people were marrying very quickly yeah. and people were marrying very young because you had to get in there before you got in there, if you know what I'm saying. And you were you were in a hurry. You're in a great big hurry. So Revival Centre Young People, and that's what they were called. We weren't called youth. We were called young people. And our mm -hmm. youth group was called Young Peoples. They were obsessed with marriage and they were obsessed with sex. Do you think it was much different in the Pentecostal scene or the great big AOG scene? Well, I, I want to put a bit of a pin in that one and come back to it and do a really deep comparison. But I think it was... Similar, like I said, there was those seeds in broader Pentecostalism, which was, you know, full-blown fruit in the revival center of control. I think definitely that was there, but certainly not to the same extreme. You know, we didn't have printed rules. and But it might have been different from, you know, from church to church or from campus to campus, as we say now. People may have a different experience in their AOG time. Yeah, look, while I agree that it, it there certainly was, was not printed forms or rules that you were sat down to comply with, I think that that was definitely, there was inference of that control. There was definitely elements of leaders trying to control who dated, who saw each other, people were pushed together, who should be married. Or, and there was definitely a, a forcing of getting married early. And I, I've seen this actually observing um people who are our age now and who've had kids and who are still in the church, quite often they get married quite early. 
I've seen, you know, 19, 20-year-olds getting married, which by uh, community standards is incredibly, incredibly young because I think the average age of marriage these days in Australia is in the early 30s, early to mid 30s. So quite, quite different standards. I think a lot of that definitely is about the fact that sex before marriage is frowned upon. So people are forced into that, that if they want to have sex, then they need to get married. Otherwise, they're not going to please God. Well, the other thing that the Revival Centre did, obviously, was they forced people to marry. So I want to tell you a story about this couple. And I was quite good friends with uh, the girl she was young, she was about 17, and I was probably about 14 or 15. And she started dating this guy from another assembly, but it was in the same city that we lived in, right? So they were seeing each other quite often. And they broke up after a little while. And she said nothing but horrible things about him. Oh, he loves himself, and he's this and he's that, and, you know, I hate him, and yada, yada, yada. That was them speaking in tongues. And then yeah. one day, she disappeared from the assembly. And yeah. you know what that meant. That meant that she'd been put out for something. And no one yeah. said where she'd gone, what had happened. Then she turns up three months later, married to this guy. What so hell? what had happened was they'd split up. He pined for her and missed her and wanted to get back together with her. And he would try all the time to get back together and she wouldn't have a bar of him. So what he did was he went to the pastor's reported some behavior, some sort of sexual behavior, and I don't know whether they'd actually slept together or, you know, he just got a bit tit or, you know, she'd wrapped her, her hand around his balls. I don't know what had actually happened, never found out. But whatever it was, the pastors deemed it serious enough to force them to marry. So this girl had broken up with him, hated him, didn't want to know him, told us all about how horrible he was and, didn't, you know, next thing you know, she tied to him for the rest of her life. That is great. Do you know to this day whether they're still together? Last time I checked, they still were because they were both still in the church. Gee. So, yeah, and, and that is not an uncommon story. But I think where it's got that little bit of a twist is the fact that instead of just being into each other, slipping up, dobbing, dobbing each other in or, you know, whatever, and or getting caught and then getting married, that actually split and she didn't yeah. want a bar of him. And he knew what he needed to do and he manipulated the situation that he was able to not only get back together with her, but, you know, forcing her to marry. And the story that I heard was that she held out after they got married, she wouldn't sleep with him Wow. for a very long time. And the story that I heard was eventually he came in one night, took control. I'm going to use sort of more gentle language, took control, if you know what I'm saying, and basically forced her to consummate the marriage. And when she reported that back, nothing was done because now you're married. You should be doing this. Yeah, she was his property probably by the standards of the congregation. I would imagine it's a, it's a disgrace. I mean, in, in anyone's language, I mean, I'll call it out. It, it's rape even within marriage, um, that That's sort right. of behaviour. So. But it's, you know, he used the system, didn't he? And that was probably learnt behaviour. Um, just like you used the system to try and get out of the revival centre. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. So tragic story. I yeah. did I did look them up a little while ago, as I said, and I saw that they were still together. But I, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe it became like an arranged marriage and you see that sort of stuff that happens in India where people don't know each other, they don't want to be together, and then after years they actually do fall in love. Maybe that happened, but I'm mm. guessing probably not. Yeah, probably not. Who knows? Who knows their story now? I mean, that was a, a long time ago, obviously, but things things do happen. People find commonalities and stay together, but that's uh, definitely the foundation of that relationship is something that would take a hell of a lot of getting through and getting over, that's for sure. Definitely. I want to tell you another story. There was a young girl who came into the church. Her brothers were already in the church, and she came in. She's actually quite pretty. So she got saved, spoken tongues, baptized the whole bit. And all of a sudden she turned up one day and there was this girl and I'm going to call her V. And everyone was 
there was a, a buzz around sort of the older the older teens and the twenty somethings around. Oh, look at her, look at her, you know. And so different guys, you know, they all waited the three months, tick tick tick, and then different guys. And she must have loved it because she, you know, had all these desperate men just throwing themselves at her. Maybe she didn't love it. Who knows? But she was she was dating a couple of guys, and then all of a sudden she disappears for three months, mm. comes back married to this one guy that we didn't even know they were together oh, right so she's you know probably because she was older she was in her 20s so she may in fact have been sexually active already comes into the church who knows whether they actually had sex again it could have just been some heavy petting whatever all of a sudden bang she's married to yep. this guy um but i just thought it was really an interesting story because when she stepped in everyone just went nuts over this girl, oh, she's gorgeous, she's this, she's that, you know, and, and and just all this desperation from a lot of the men and a lot of the young men in the church. And then some guy went too far or she went too far with him or they went too far with each other, however you want to frame it. Next thing you know, poor girl. So, you know, when she signed up to come into the church and, you know, speaking tongues, get baptised, hang out with her brothers, her, her, you know, her siblings, I'm sure she wasn't signing up to be forced to marry someone. And I would imagine there would have been a lot of pressure from her brothers who had been in the church for quite a long time yeah. to make sure that she followed through. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and I mean, you think of um, of our times in, in youth groups and stuff when, whether it was a, a new guy or a new girl coming in, it, it was a bit like fresh meat, wasn't it? Like they generally would have a hive of activity around them. The, any of the single people who were interested, you know, were buzzing around. Because it was quite an incestuous space, like everyone it sort of dated within the, the same circles. I mean, quite often at Great Big AOG, people weren't dating people at other churches or congregations. I mean, there was certainly examples of that, but generally it was fairly incestuous. Yeah, why do you think that was? Because I know some of the smaller suburban AOGs around us, they did tend to, and maybe it's because they were forced to because they were so small, but they did tend to mix and they did tend to date each other from different yeah. different churches, different assemblies. Why do you think it was with Great Big AOG that we didn't? And it wasn't just dating. We didn't mix with them hardly at all. We'd go to Youth Alive rallies and go, oh, there's them, and, and yeah. then we wouldn't see them again. Oh, I, I think what you said before, I think, was a large part of that, that we didn't need to. It was enormous. You know, at its peak, that youth group was hundreds, hundreds of people. So there was a, enough to go around, really. I mean, you were mixing with uh, fairly large crowds. You obviously had your your people that you would hang around and your tribe, but it was a very, very large group of people. So there, there wasn't really a need, I don't think. And I think also part of that was we were quite elitist. Um, we were the best. We were the ultimate youth group. I mean, yeah, we, we drew, were the great big AOG, weren't we? It, well, that's right. And and we drew people into the congregation, whether it was youth group, whether it was the, the broader church. I mean, people saw it as a very attractive place to come. So I think there was always fresh meat, for lack of a better phrase. Tell me your story. Some of the some of the girls you dated, or some of the situations you had. So let's move on to Great Big AOG. Let's move on to yeah, that broader yeah. Pentecostal story. What what happened for you? I think I had a, a very unhealthy view of relationships coming into the church. It, it scared me a lot. Um, I didn't know expectations when I came in. I was I was what seventeen, um, and and I think there was there were rules I found quite difficult to navigate, like. When you were seeing someone, could you just see someone? Could you just hang out? Could you just be in a um, relationship with someone that wasn't wasn't going to to lead on to marriage? And probably I surmised fairly quickly that you really couldn't. There was a lot of pressure, even if you are hanging out with somebody and genuinely just hanging out as friends of the opposite sex. There was a lot of pressure to explain that and to explain, were you dating? What were your intentions? I was quite scared around that space and really, really apprehensive because I felt judging eyes upon me. So I didn't prolifically date when I came into Great Big AOG. I remember there was a time when a preacher came and he came from England and he came to our youth group and he spoke and he got us all he said, oh, I want all the young men, I want you to stand up, you know, and we all stood up. And then he started to, not not in a really bad way, but in a parental kind of way, he started to berate us young men for not getting married, for not 
sweeping some of these young women off their feet. And and he actually said, you know, if you are not dating someone and you are over this age, blah, 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 it is your business to to be married. It is your business to be having families, et cetera, and sort of lifted the lid on the culture because I kind of felt like within Great Big AOG and within the youth group at that time, in that sort of early 90s time, there was a culture that said it's not very spiritual to be thinking about wives and husbands and dating you should just be pursuing the lord and we were almost like a bunch of catholic nuns and brothers and there was a couple of people that had relationships and we certainly didn't look down on them but most of us that weren't in one it wasn't the done thing no i don't think it was um and and if you look at people that were caught up within that space i mean quite often relationships were fostered in quite an unhealthy environment and you didn't have a reference point because we've spoken about many times before everything was your reference point was very insular you also had dating advice from pastors who had never dated but had dated the one person and then married them um, because they'd been brought up in the church so i think it was quite unhealthy unhealthy and i mean you do see a lot of those people that were together around that time when we were all dating or getting married, a lot of them aren't together anymore. You know, I think that reflects broader society. Divorce rates are quite high. Um, I think two in three marriages end in divorce in Australia. Shouldn't it be a point of difference within the church if it's a healthier environment? Because it's certainly not. I don't think it's um, reflective of any healthier relationships, that's for sure. Yeah, and there were very few people in the church that had married in the church and then divorced in the church and then stayed in Great Big AOG. Certainly there were people that had divorced and then gotten saved and come in, but it was almost as if the people that divorced, they disappeared. So there was no model of that, right? So all we saw were successful marriages. That was all we saw. Yeah, it's, it, it is interesting. I mean, when I obviously I, I met my um, ex-wife in Great Big AOG and we started dating, and as I, I think I've said before, she sort of sat on that there outer edge. She was quite alternative um, and didn't really get that involved in the, in the youth group as such. And there was, I know there was a lot of warnings for me from people saying, oh, this person's not quite as dedicated as we'd hope for someone like you who's on that trajectory to ministry. Um, and I know that I tried to force her to conform with that um, and get in, more involved in the youth group, get more involved in coming to church more regularly. Was that coming from leadership? Were yes. leaders speaking to you, pastors? Yep, yep, from pastors. Um, you know, definitely three particular ones come to mind that spoke quite, and a pastor's wife. I remember a pastor's wife um, bailing me up once and saying, what are your intentions? What are you going to do? What are you waiting for, essentially? Um, and is this the right person? So I felt a real pressure to, I guess, to fast track it. I mean, we... we started dating and from the time we were dating to we were married was only i don't know what it was maybe 18 20 months so it wasn't actually that long and in in the real world i mean you, you wouldn't get married that fast but obviously you know you're trying to abstain you're trying to um make sure you do the right thing in the eyes of god and um so you fast track that marriage you don't work through that stuff that you should. And I know that we did this pre-marriage course, which I think it was, I think it might have been attached to Bill Hybels. I think that it's some... The Willow like, Creek. Yeah, I think it was the Willow Mega Creek. Megachurch, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that it was like a, a six or a ten-week marriage course that you'd go through pre-marriage counselling with your pastor. Um, and we did that, and we went through it, and it asked all those hard-hitting questions like, are you spiritually on track, on the same track? Um, what do you think about kids? Um, when should you have kids? What's your life course? Is your life course aligned? And absolutely, you want to get married to someone who, whose life course is has some sort of alignment. But you know what? Two individuals can come together and still be two individuals <laughs> as well. And you weren't taught that. You had to be one. And I think it was some of that doctrine around, you know, you become one in Christ. So you should become one in purpose. And I think that infiltrated and became really unhealthy 
in your mindset for relationships? Well, it certainly did for me anyway. Were there any trick questions in there? You know, does she have one boob bigger than the other? Or, you know, does does B's knob have a bend in it or something like that just to see, you know, to spring it on you? And next thing you know, you're answering it and the pastor would be like, yeah, how did you know that? I feel that there should be an addendum to that um, that test now to put that in. But no, no, you couldn't ever talk about that. Were there any questions about sex or sexual compatibility? Uh, no, because you the expectation was that you wouldn't know if you're sexually compatible because you haven't had sex. So I don't remember any questions around sex. And because it was really was quite taboo, wasn't it? Um, I mean, it was referred to, but it was generally referred to in such an incredibly holy sense that you you couldn't think about it, the fact that, you know, <laughs> We're two humans, we have sex, that's what we do. So I think it was a, a quite an unhealthy mindset within the space for sure. How about you? What was your experience in Great Big AOG? One of the things that I remember was there was a couple of people that actually, a couple of girls that got knocked up, right? A couple of couples that got knocked up. And I remember saying to one of the guys, why didn't you use a condom? And he said, because if I'd carried a condom, that's like premeditating. <laughs> you know, that's 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 like saying you're going to do it before you're doing it. So they didn't carry condoms or do any sort of, you know, protection or anything like that because that was admitting defeat. So instead, in the heat of the moment, you know, two young people, lights are off, Barry White's playing, whatever's going on, or in our case, DZ Talk's playing. And, and next thing you know, it's happening. And so there was there was teenage pregnancy, right? Or there was, you know, young, unwanted pregnancy. Yeah. So there was no preparation for that. To plan would be to basically premeditate. And I remember saying that to that to one of the guys who I said, why didn't you wear a, a dinger? And he goes, a dinger? You're not going to stop. If you could stop, you'd stop. You're not going to stop and go to 7-Eleven. Yeah. Right? It's so interesting. She, ended up, she ended up with a baby and they got married I much younger. Yeah, yeah, and and you know you you can't um you, you can't carry a condom, and uh, I I agree with that guy's logic. I mean, there's no way you could do that and and pretend that uh, it all was okay. I remember a mate once, and it only just came to mind. Then his car had broken down near my house. He lived like twenty k's away, and anyway, he had called me and said, "Dude, my car's broken down here." just realized i've left my wallet in there can you go and get it and we were catching up later that day or the next day whatever and he goes no i'll grab it from you then and i went and grabbed it and i remember i picked it up out of the car condom fell out and i remember did saying you go to, through his wallet is that was that actually happening or did it just happen to fall out no i promise you i did not go through it i actually picked it up and whether I dropped it or not or whatever, but I remember the condom falling out and I remember confronting on going, what is this? You know, you've got a condom in there. Blah, blah. And um, he was um, he was unapologetic, <laughs> surprisingly. And um, he he goes, yeah, yeah, I carry it in there. Of course, you just never know what's going to come up. And he was he was at church. He was involved in church. And I, and I thought, well, you know what's going to come up if you're going to use that. But um yeah, it was really interesting, but I just remembered that one, and I remember being how shocked because I was so incredibly self righteous. I was like, "Dude, how can you do this and call yourself a Christian?" See, that's exactly what I'm saying. On the one hand, it was smart, it was wise, it was the right thing to do to prepare in that way. But from our belief system, it was premeditation. It was basically saying, "I'm going to do this," you know, and. It, neither, it doesn't have to be either. You know, like you could have actually carried a condom knowing your weakness <laughs> rather than carrying a condom thinking, I'm just going to fuck around. Yep. But we would never, we'd never have dared allow ourselves to think that way. No, no, you couldn't. That, that you would be purely evil and you'd be preying upon girls. There's no doubt mm. about it. But it was all those all those things I remember, like um, lots of words being delivered. Um, I remember a specific one being delivered to me and my now ex-wife from one of the pastors talking about um, how God wanted us to get married and how we were going to do great things and how we were going to... Great things for God. Yeah, of course. That, that was the word, wasn't it? That was the word for everyone. You're going to do great things for God. You're going to do great things together. 
Absolutely. It was a very generic, it was like reading your star signs. But, you know, we fell for it hook, line and sinker and thought, well, there's confirmation. And, and I think it was around a time when, you know, we went through a lot of shit and I was probably trying to manipulate her into getting married also because we, you had to, it was the thing you had to do. And we um, got that word and went, oh, okay, well, that one's confirmed. I guess we've got to get married. And it was, it would have fed in, like I can't remember that. It was a long time ago, but it, uh, it would have definitely fed into the logic of why we had to get married when we got married. And we weren't super young. I was 23, she was 21. But it was, we were definitely young maturity-wise, I think, and quite sheltered given uh, our relationship was certainly under the umbrella of the church. I can remember coming into the church, coming into Great Big AOG and still sort of being open to this or new to this idea of God will speak to you, etc. And I remember I went to a party once. Well, it wasn't a party. It was a, as a supper. Do you remember? We'd go to youth yes. or we'd go to church on a Sunday night and then you'd go back to someone's house or some, some place. Usually it was someone's house and you'd have supper. You know, people would bring warm bottles of Coke because they couldn't, couldn't afford going to 7-Eleven and buying, you know, one for twice the price. So we'd drink warm Coke, chips. There was just so much MSG, chocolate, you know, full on. But anyway, we'd go back to these suppers. And I remember, and, and it was a lot of flirting would happen there. And I remember going back to this house one night and meeting this girl. I'm going to call her Elle. Yeah. And I remember talking to her and she just had these piercing blue eyes. She wasn't that gorgeous. There wasn't, yeah. you know, it wasn't like you'd look at her and go, she's really pretty, but something about her. And also, you know, I didn't have a girlfriend and I was probably, you know, pining, whatever. And she just, she just, I just got hooked that night. And I went home that night and started praying yeah. about her. That was the night that I believed that God spoke to me. It was like thoughts in my mind, right? It wasn't like I heard a word outside of me or anything, you know, typical, just that feeling where I thought, she's your wife, yeah. that girl. You know, that girl you just met, the one with the really nice eyes, but not too pretty, you know her, she's your wife. And I was like, oh, okay. So that's my wife. I obsessed over that girl. I don't know how long it was. I don't know if it was months or if it was years, but it was a long time because I was like, well, she's my wife. Yeah. That's that's my wife. And I, and I told her sister. Yeah, I'm going to marry your sister. Didn't tell her, just told her sister, <laughs> knowing full well that she was going to tell her sister. And I, I've seen in the Facebook group that people have talked about, you know, men trying to manipulate women by saying God's spoken to them, etc. I get that. I get that happens. And possibly that's exactly, you're going to hear this story and say that that's exactly what I was doing. But I swear to God, I swear to, you know, to the gods, I swear to Zeus, whoever you need me to swear to, I wasn't doing it on purpose. I wasn't intentionally trying to force this girl to marry me. I actually liked her. Something had switched on in me. I went home and prayed. Part of myself spoke to another part of myself and said, oh, I'm God and she's the one for you. And and I was convinced of this. It, yep. wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, that other story I told you where, you know, she didn't want to borrow me and I was going to manipulate and all that. Not at all. She didn't know. And I dared not speak to her for months. You know, wouldn't I'd be in the same room as her and I'd walk away. Because I was like, oh, this was all so serious and all so intense. And eventually, we did end up dating and yep. we even got engaged. And then her parents stepped in and split us up. Yep. You know, she's in her mid-20s. I'm in my low 20s. And her parents stepped in and split us up. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation, right? That's a whole nother episode. But nevertheless, it wasn't God, right? Yep. Obviously, you know. And And then the mother, her mother got a word from God, actually. That's right. Her mother got a word from God that was Twitter split up. Oh. And so she, yeah, so she came back to me one day and said, we have to pray for my mum. My mum's going through some things. Um, wouldn't tell me what it was. And then a few months later, oh, by the way, mum got a word from God and we have to split up. Now, I think this girl was ready to split up, right? Because yeah. she just was like, yeah, okay, fine. We're splitting up. Bye. You know. But then I found out later on that mum, what, what we had to pray about mum for, which I wouldn't be, wasn't being told, was that mum was going in and out of the psych ward yeah, because of mental health problems. And so looking at this story and, you know, you wonder what the hell's going on here. I get a word from God saying that I'm going to marry this girl. 
I don't tell her, I tell her sister. I stay away from her for a really long time. We finally get together. We date for a little while. Then I tell her that God's told me. Then mum's in and out of the psych ward. She's getting words from God saying that we shouldn't be married. And then we end up splitting up and boom, boom. And I had a whole crisis of faith. Like, am I hearing God? Am I not hearing God? I said, what a fucking mess. Sounds like you dodged a bullet though. But I think this is definitely another episode that we need to bring up. But I work quite closely with the mental health system um, and have done for years. There is a lot of ex-fundamentalist Pentecostals, evangelicals that pass through the mental health system, specifically into mental health units and psych wards. Significant amount. I don't know statistically what it is um, and how high the numbers are, but anecdotally, quite high numbers. Mm. Yeah, well, no doubt, no doubt. Did you ever hear of domestic violence or any conversations about domestic violence within Great Big AOG? Not one single one. And I think because, I mean, my take on it is a very um, it's a very unhealthy environment that I think marriage was seen as ownership. And particularly if you were a male, um, you had ownership of your wife um, when you got married. I think there was a lot of manipulation and twisting of scriptures within that space. And women were definitely seen as inferior. It was an incredibly patriarchal community and society. Oh, intensely um, so, intensely so. Absolutely. And, and you know, it. I think it really did breed a contempt or a disrespect towards women. Um, so I don't think it would have even been named as an issue. Mm. When I was the youth pastor, assistant pastor, whatever you want to call it, I remember the pastor then not being too keen on my then girlfriend who later became my wife. But he actually said to me one day, I don't think you should be with her. You need a woman that's going to darn your socks. Oh, so, God. Because, because my wife is actually, my my ex-wife now, of course, is actually quite a successful woman in industry and business. And she was showing all the signs of that, right? She was well-educated. She had a great job. I was wanting to be in ministry and she was wanting to sort of go that way. Now, there's a whole conversation around, you know, were we going in different directions, et cetera. But I still thought it was funny that basically what that minister said to me that day is he said to me, you need a woman like mine yeah. who is small, diminished, is not really good for much except the housework. That's what you need. Yeah. I had a similar experience with a pastor, not the one that you're talking about, who um, also, because as we've spoken about before, I was pegged like you for full-time ministry to be a full-time pastor. And the question was put to my ex-wife um, before we got married is, have you got what it takes to become a pastor's wife? And it was all about that servanthood. So it was serving your husband and serving your husband's purpose. And I had a problem with that because I remember, you know, she was uh, quite a creative soul and someone who certainly I think would be submissive, but someone who had their own take and their own, sorry, their own thing to to contribute to the space and, and i think that was slightly discouraged mm. or maybe oh, definitely so slightly. definitely but you and i were already products of the broader society which mm. was much more open to women being you know even even in the 80s and the 90s right it was it was much more feminized in in the sense of feminism and so we we didn't have a problem with a woman being successful in her job we didn't have a problem with a woman being strong in the house etc well, I didn't anyway, and, and and I'm sure you didn't. So I didn't think it made sense to me that I needed this diminished woman because I would have been bored with a diminished woman. I wanted a woman that was going to challenge me, a woman that was going to be a partner, a woman that was going to, you know. And look, there's a whole other episode around divorce and what really went wrong with that marriage. But it wasn't because she was strong. It wasn't because she was... Uh, he had so much potential as a person that was never an issue yeah yeah look I, I probably bought into it a bit more and thought and and my ego probably got the better of me and thought no i do i think i do need someone that's going to serve the ministry and if the ministry is headed up by me then i need someone who's going to serve that so i probably bought into that a bit more than i would have or should have because that was really sewn into me 
that that's what you needed. And I think it was very much like you spoke about that example of needing a woman that will darn your socks. Um, it was very similar. It was someone who will serve you because you'll be out front. You'll be the one who is uh, the star of the show. I'm in love with this moment that for once – T was the more progressive thinker in the AOG than B. That hasn't happened before, I don't think. I'm quite excited about this moment. No, I I, I wanted her to be in ministry with me, but I wanted us to be together. I, yeah. you know, I didn't want it to be the T show and she tagged along. I actually wanted her to be a big part of it and, you know, but she didn't want that after yeah. all, right? She was a pastor's daughter. She'd seen it her whole life. She, did, she didn't want a bar of it. So, And, and that's, that's a different conversation to have. But it certainly was nothing to do with her being powerful. I had no problem with women pastors. I had no problem with women leaders. I, you know, still to this day, obviously, have no problem with working for women, working under women. I, I think it's brilliant. And so I think I brought that value with me into, into Great Big AOG. But that certainly wasn't there in the revival center. As a matter of fact, I know of a story where there was one woman who was being physically abused, you know, violence wise, even sexually abused by her husband. Yeah. And when she reported it to the church, they did nothing about it. And eventually she had to leave the church to leave her marriage. And he was allowed to stay in. He mm -hmm. was allowed to stay in the church because he hadn't done the leaving. And so that's that's why I asked you, you know, in Great Big AOG, was there any experience of domestic violence or conversations around domestic violence? Because like you, I never heard one. And there is no way that it wasn't going on. Mm. There is no way that it wasn't being reported to pastors. Yeah. Matter of fact, B, I can also remember there was one story where a girl accused her boyfriend of rape. Yep. And it became public knowledge amongst the youth group that he had actually well, that she had accused him of rape. He was put out of the church for a time and yeah. then came back. And I don't know, obviously, this is the days before mandatory reporting or whatever the process, were, or maybe it wasn't, I don't know, you're more in that space. But nothing was done no. at, at a criminal level. Yeah, and look, nothing was done for him either. I mean, this is what this is what we did, didn't we? Um, we would put people out of out of the church, out of the fold, essentially excommunicate them for a time. It was generally three months from memory. There seemed to be a magical magical, magical time frame, but supporting him um, to be able to get help for his behaviour as well, to not for any other reason, but to protect more people from being harmed by his behaviour. But no, we just chuck him out and go, there you go, we're just going to pray for you. The old will pray for you. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Well, mate, I, I think this really leads us on to a divorce episode, really, and looking at sort of, you know, relationship problems and, you know, people that shouldn't get married and do or people that do get married and then don't get the support for working through things. I think we could have a whole other episode on divorce. Yeah, I think we could. And and also, you know, some of the stuff that that brings up and the taboo of it um, and the baggage that gets attached to you as a result. Well, mate. I know this has been a heavy one, people. I know it's been a very heavy topic, and I don't feel like we really came up with a lot of answers other than to say, gee, that was shit. Mm, yeah. Look, I don't, I don't think quite often we don't come up with answers. I think we we put it out there and, and you know, again, leaning on the Facebook group, this is where some of the discussions happen. So have discussions, reach out to each other. Um, but also, I don't think we have the answers either. Yeah, indeed. All right, so I'm going to cue the music. And I just want to remind people that next week our episode is on... Are you ready for this? This is a nice little light and fluffy one again. Are you ready? It's on sexual predators within church. Mmm. Yeah. That should be a fun discussion. Mm. All right. I'll see you next week. Bye, darling.